Welcome back. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a few things at the top, and then happy to take your questions. Uh, first, Secretary Austin welcomed Polish Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of National Defense Koshiniak Kamesh, Kamish to the Pentagon today. The two leaders discussed the ongoing war in Ukraine and how Putin's war of choice continues to threaten our shared security. The Secretary commended Poland for its exceptional leadership on Ukraine, including providing vital logistics support and substantial security assistance. The, sec the Secretary also thanked the Deputy Prime Minister for supporting the nearly 10,000 American troops deployed in Poland that ensure NATO can deter and, if necessary, defend against aggression. Secretary Austin also spoke by phone with his Romanian counterpart, Minister of National Defense Tolver, earlier today. They discussed the strength of the U.S.-Romania bilateral defense relationship, our partnership within NATO, and Russia's war in Ukraine. The two leaders reaffirmed their unwavering commitment to bolstering the defense of NATO's eastern flank and reiterated their continued support for Ukraine to defend itself against Russian aggression. A full, a full readout of both the Secretary's bilat and phone call will be posted later today on defense.gov. Speaking of Ukraine, tomorrow Secretary Austin will host Ukrainian Minister of Defense Umerov here at the Pentagon. While I won't get ahead of that meeting, I will say that you can expect the Secretary to reaffirm the United States' unwavering support for Ukraine in the face of Russian aggression. He will also receive a battlefield update, including on Kursk. And looking to next week, Secretary Austin will travel to Ramstein to host an in-person meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. This will be the 24th meeting of the UDCG since Secretary Austin formed the group in April 2022. The Secretary will be joined by Chairman Brown in Ramstein and will convene ministers of defense and senior military officials from nearly 50 nations to discuss the ongoing war in Ukraine and the continued close coordination by the international community to provide Ukraine with the necessary means it needs to defend itself. Switching gears to the Middle East, earlier this week, the Cape Trinity arrived from Cyprus to Port the port of Ashdod and has begun the process of unloading the remaining pallets of humanitarian aid. And that's approximately 6 million pounds of aid to be distributed within Gaza. The offloading process is expected to take between four to six days. Once complete, the Cape Trinity is slated to make a stop in Greece to unload a portion of its crew and then will depart for its home station. Switching gears again. Uh, the Department of Defense recently received a request for assistance from the Department of Homeland Security for additional military support capabilities to, afford, to be afforded to major presidential and vice presidential candidates. The Secretary of Defense approved the request and directed the commander of U.S. Northern Command to plan and provide and execute increased support to the United States Secret Service at various locations across the United States during the 2024 election campaigns. The Department of Defense will provide protective support and will and that will continue through the election on November 5th, 2024, with anticipated continued support to the president-elect and vice president-elect through the inauguration of January 20, 2025. And finally, yesterday, the 2024 Paralympic Games officially kicked off with opening ceremonies in Paris. This year, the department is proud to be cheering on three U.S. service member athletes who will be competing in these Paralympic Games. U.S. Army Sergeant First Class John Ross and U.S. Army Staff Sergeant Kevin Wynn will compete in the 50-meter mixed rifle event. And U.S. Army Sergeant First Class Elizabeth Marks will compete in seven different swimming events. On behalf of the department, we're rooting for you. Go Team USA. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Tara. Um, all right, I've got three topics for you, but first on the, uh, the extra support to Secret Service. Sure. What does that mean um, in practical terms? Are we going to see National Guardsmen patrolling sites? What's been asked for? Um, for more specifics on that, Tara, I would direct you to the National Guard and, and Secret Service. I don't have that uh, level of specificity. Um, so I'd actually, I think Secret Service could better speak to their request on that. So I'd direct you there. All right. But under what authorities are they operating? I'd direct you to Secret Service on that. Okay. Um, secondly, to get back to the third anniversary mm -hmm. of Abbey Gate, and uh, the Trump campaign's appearance at Arlington National Cemetery. Um, U.S. federal law says that Army National Cemeteries will not be used in partisan or political activities. Did the Trump campaign break the law by filming an ad there? 
Um, look, for anything regarding any campaign ads, I would direct you to the campaign to speak to that, to the Trump campaign. Um, what I can tell you is that, and I think the Army recently put out a statement earlier today that kind of went through what exactly happened in the incident. Um, you can go on Arlington National Cemetery's website. It's very clear the rules and regulations. Um, what I'll say about the mission of those that work at Arlington National Cemetery. Um, these are people who are um, dedicated to honoring our fallen heroes. And um, they maintain that hallowed ground. They work with the families um, in honoring those who have had their loved one lost. Um, I'm just not going to go beyond what the Army has said, other than that, um, you know, there was a, a report that was filed. Um, but Subsequently, that person decided not to press charges, and so we're just going to uh, we stand by the army statement that this matter is closed. Why would this? Why would the army close the matter if the person has decided not to press charges? The army could still pursue it without mm -hmm. that person pressing charges. But secondly, the the fact of filming an ad on a national cemetery, if the army doesn't further pursue this with either civil penalties or, or whatever can be done. What's to stop the next person from filming a political ad there? Well, what what I would say is the rules are very, very clear. They're also online um, and available on the Arlington National Cemetery website. Um, that is really a decision that the Army has to make. That's not one that the department is making. That's for the Army to make. Um, the Army considers this matter closed. The department stands behind the Army on that. Jen. So, Sabrina, I'm trying to understand, in your understanding, what happened at the cemetery? Yeah. Um, and also, I'm sorry, you had also, just to go back to your earlier question on under the authorities, I direct you to the National Guard on that because it's going to vary on location. So I, I'm sorry, I should have been a little bit more specific. I would just refer you to the National Guard under what authorities those guardsmen are going to operate. Um, in terms of your question on what exactly happened, I'd refer you to the Army to speak more to the actual incident itself. Um, my understanding is that the families um, had invited, um, you know, uh, a few guests to attend a ceremony earlier this week. Um, and there was some type of incident that happened between an employee at the ANC um, and a member that was traveling with another group's party. Um, for more details on that, I'd refer you to, to the Army to speak to that. But incident is a very mm -hmm. sanitized word. What actually happened? From my understanding, yeah. was it verbal assault? Who did what? From my understanding and from what the Army said is that um, an ANC employee who attempted to ensure um, adherence to the rules of the ANC was pushed aside. Um, the employee acted with professionalism and decorum, but there was a bit of a, um, an incident that did happen. So there are two different issues here. There's a potential assault charges that the person has decided not to bring, but there's also federal law that was broken, as yeah. Tara mentioned, uh, filming a campaign ad or using campaign propaganda um, fr with the backdrop of, these, um, of the cemetery. Can't the department refer that to the Justice Department for pursuit? That's really, yes, that can happen, but that is some, a decision that the Army would have to make, and that's not um, my understanding, is that the Army is considering this matter closed. Um, but in terms of, just to get to your broader question on political ads, um, that's not something that the department has a say over. That's something that gets adjudicated at the FEC level and between campaigns. So that, for anything that's used in an ad, I would refer you to the campaigns to speak to that. But it is a federal law yeah. not to use what is essentially a base that is controlled yeah. by this department and the defense secretary could overrule the army why is he deciding not to overrule or get involved in this look uh what we want to focus on is the fact that um the people that work at the arlington national cemetery every single day um, do so with dignity, work to preserve the memories of those who have made the ultimate sacrifice, and ultimately work with the families who visit Arlington National Cemetery. And, um, you know, there are nearly, I think it's like 3,000 public ceremonies that are conducted at Arlington National Cemetery um, every single year without incident. Um, the rules and regulations are very, very clear. What happened uh, earlier this week is very unfortunate. Um, it's really the decision for the Army to make and, and to pursue any other path forward, 
the department right now is not doing that, um, and the Army, we, we stand behind the Army in considering this matter closed. Just the last okay. question. Sorry, but mm -hmm. on the National Guard Association appearance by former President Trump, there were National Guardsmen in uniform who stood up and cheered uh, what was a political speech at the event, a campaign-style speech. Um, is that against the rules? Um, I believe that was a pri I, I, I don't know enough about that event, honestly, so I just don't want to speak to it from here. Um, I'm happy to look into that and, and come back to you. I think, so, yeah. I think that it is against the rules. Warren. Uh, Ukraine lost uh, an F-16. Has Ukraine communicated that to the U.S.? Does the U.S. have any sense of, of whether it was downed by Russian fire or by something else? And has Ukraine asked the U.S. for any assistance in the investigation? I've seen the reports. I'm not aware of any assistance or request for assistance from the Ukrainian side to us about um, this particular incident. Um, but I'd refer you to the Ukrainians more to speak to to speak to any specifics on this pilot. Yes. Uh, thank you, Sister Sabrina. Um, a little bit of background to the question is: uh, American troops are being attacked in Syria, Iraq, and from Yemen. Uh, terrorists in those countries are also attacking Israel. So, whose responsibility is it to stop the attack? of the attacks and the attackers, and I have a follow-up. Um, well, that's a pretty broad question. Um, but as you know, since the since October 7th, we have been postured to defend Israel. Um, I'm not going to go through the, the, you know, all the things that we have done in terms of uh, moving our forces to the region to de-escalate tensions. Um, what I can tell you is that our forces as you probably are aware, we have two carrier strike groups in the Central Command AOR. We also have assets um, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, they're there to protect our forces. They're also there to help defend Israel should we need to defend Israel. Um, and of course, we will always take care of our troops, whether they be in Iraq and Syria. Um, and we've maintained the force protection to do that. And you had a follow up? Yeah, the follow up is since terrorist groups within Syria, Iraq and Yemen, are proxies of Iran, then why isn't the Pentagon stopping the source, which is Iran? So um, I will tell you that uh, we always reserve the right to respond at a time and place out of our choosing. When we have been attacked, whether it be in Iraq or Syria, we have responded. Um, and I'm just going to leave it at that. I will uh, go to the phones and then happy to come back in the rooms. Uh, Idris, Reuters. Hey, Sabrina, just, um, I mean, you know uh, quite well, uh, getting a statement through uh, the different layers can be quite tricky, given that this was quite an extraordinary statement and, and quite rare for the Army to come out and say what it did say. Did they go through OSD? Did they go through the White House uh, before uh, putting the statement out? Or were you not aware of it? And was the Secretary not aware of it before it was put out? You want us to go through a, an approval process checklist of internal deliberations, Idris? I'm just not going to do that. But we are aware of the statement that the Army issued, and we we support we support what the Army said. Um, all right, next question, JJ Green, WTOP. Thanks, Sabrina, for this. Um, to the the question uh, about the the F-16 that crashed in in, in Ukraine, killing the pilot. Um, you know. Can you say how many F-16, U.S.-made F-16s are in Ukraine or, or, or on their way or will be sent there? And um, um, what, if anything, can you say about that incident more than what you said to Oren? JJ, un unfortunately, this will um, not be very satisfactory to you, but I'm just not going to get into numbers of how many F-16s are in Ukraine. That's something for them to speak to. Um, that uh, opens up a lot of operational security issues as well. So I'm just not going to be able to speak to that. In terms of the incident and, and the pilot that you know has been referenced and that Oren had asked about earlier, um, I'm just not going to be able to provide more. That's really something for Ukraine to speak to. Um, we have been... Uh, as you know, training pilots here in the United States. Um, I will say that, broadly speaking, combat aviation is incredibly complex. Um, and we've been very proud to train some of the pilots here in the United States, and not just here, but our partners and allies um, through the UDCG are also training um, Ukrainian pilots on F-16s. Um, and, you know, Every day that those they fly those those aircraft, um, these are brave men and women going up there to defend their skies and to defend their country. And so um, we're very proud to have been part of training some of those here in the United States. Uh, but I just don't have more to add on that on that particular incident. 
I'll take one more from the phone and then happy to come into the room. Uh, uh, sorry, I think uh, Eric Schmidt, New York Times. Charlie. Thank you, Sabrina. Going back to the F-16. Sure. American trained pilot, uh, American equipped F-16s, including, I think, a new electronics uh, warfare package, American advised, which is still going on. Are you, are you telling we're not tracking, we don't have the reason for what happened when it has consequence for the United States? I'm just telling you that I cannot confirm the incident. I'd refer you to the Ukrainians to speak to their own uh, operations. We, as the United States, are tracking the F-16s that we've appreciate covered. the question, but I'm just not going to get into any more specifics about the incident. Changing gears, you sure. say. Um, it seems the Houthis have been acting up again. Do we have um, a force presence uh, in the Red Sea? Um, through Operation Prosperity Guardian, between the U.S. and our allies and partners, we always maintain a presence within the Red Sea. Um, I can't speak to specific ships that are there right now, but we do have, through partners and allies, um, a presence there. Cheney. Thank you, Sabrina. Two questions. Uh, it is reported that North Korea registered 13 submarines with the International Maritime Organization. This can be seen as an intention to wage war overseas. What do you think of the background to this? I'm not aware of that report, Janie, so I just don't have anything to offer on that one. Can I yeah, sure, you have a follow-up? Yeah. yeah. North Korean Kim Jong-un declared uh, support for Putin's war in Ukraine. And uh, could this be seen having international military training in mind, such as with North Korea, Russia, or China? That's really for North Korea to speak to. It's not a surprise that, uh, you know, North Korea has has pledged support to Russia. We've spoken about that pretty publicly. Um, we've spoken about the fact that uh, DPRK continues to provide capabilities to Russia that they're using on the battlefield in Ukraine. Um, we can only really speak to what we're doing. And you know what we're doing, Janie, is through the UDCG, we, uh, the Secretary convenes you know, 50 countries and partners around the world to support Ukraine and its battle on, on what it needs on the battlefield. Um, there's gonna be another meeting next week. That's another opportunity for allies and partners to come together to ensure that Ukraine has what it needs on the battlefield. But I'm just not gonna speak for the DPRK. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Sabrina. Uh, there has been domestic uh, criticism that U.S. is spending too much as compared to its allies uh, uh, to protect the interest of allies. Even Donald Trump said that it will uh, insist uh, NATO members to spend at least 3% of their, their GDP on defense. Do you think so? That is this because of the leading role of the U.S. that uh, Ukraine is able to uh, do such advances and able to resist such attack till now? You're talking about countries increasing their, their defense spending? Yes, um, said that uh, mm -hmm. I will insist uh, NATO members to increase from 2% to 3%. Even NATO members are not spending 2% of their D GDP on defense. And uh, U.S. Uh, is like spending major... Uh, well, we, actually, uh, we actually have seen an increase of NATO members spending more when it comes to um, committing to uh, you know, meeting defense requirements. Um, that's actually something that this administration has been leading on and urging um, you know, allies, a, a part of the NATO alliance, to do just that. Um, you've seen commitments come out of Vilna Vilnius. Um, you know, last year, you saw the NATO summit here in Washington, D.C., where multiple NATO countries announced further commitments to supporting Ukraine. So again, we're on the right track here. Um, countries are continuing to, to deepen their cooperation and knitting together their resources to support Ukraine. Um, and, you know, it's it's been incredible to watch. And that's something that you really did see come together at the Washington summit here um, over the summer. Uh, just to um, follow up, uh -huh. uh, uh, Turkey is also a NATO um, ally of the mm -hmm. U.S. So Turkey has some kind of reservation, especially uh, about uh, uh, the situation in Syria, some concern in Syria. So has this administration able to address the concerns of Turkey? We are uh, have a great 
partner in Turkey. Um, I can't speak to their um, criticisms or concerns other than to tell you that we, you know, we work with Turkey on a regular basis, um, including with what is happening on in the Middle East. I'm just going to leave it at that. Joseph. Thanks. The mm -hmm. um, Secretary has routine conversations with, with his Israeli counterpart. <laughs> Was he or anybody at the department notified ahead of um, the operations in the West Bank over the last 24 hours? To my knowledge, we were not notified about operations in the West Bank. Um, we are aware that, you know, Israel or the IDF is conducting some type of operations there. Um, we're trying to get a better understanding of what they're doing. But to my knowledge, we were not notified beforehand. And then um, yesterday there was a meeting between Arab military attaches and counterparts here at the, re uh, in the, at the Pentagon. Can you say anything more? Is that Was that just a routine meeting? Was it, uh, I mean, obviously with the context of everything and the backdrop of everything going on in the region, it seems to have been, come at a, at a uh, an interesting time. Yeah, my understanding is this was a working level meeting that happens routinely. Um, I wouldn't read too much into the timing. It's just something that ha that, that does happen. Uh -huh. uh, Pat's our general writer said that the uh, the ship that was attacked by the Houthis uh, recently. The So Union. Yes, the So Union was uh, appeared to be leaking. The EU said yesterday, and then today they came out and said it's not leaking. So can you tell us anything about why the Pentagon assesses it to be leaking and you not? So there is, um, so what I will tell you is the, the tanker is carrying 1 million barrels of crude, crude oil. Those barrels remain intact right now. The vessel itself is leaking some oil from where it was hit. Um, there is still a fire going on or multiple fires still burning on the, the ship itself. Those fires have not been able to have been put out by anyone because the Houthis are threatening to attack, um, you know, the like uh, any type of you know salvage recovery um, mission right now. Um, so those fires have the potential to spread, which has the potential to get to those oil barrels, which will then obviously leak potentially one million barrels of crude oil into the Red Sea, destroying major ecological systems um, and you know creating an environmental. I think catastrophe is the only word to use. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for the opportunity. Our State Department designated terrorist group uh, Bloch Liberation Army attacked Pakistan's southwestern province on August 26th, killed almost 70 people, including security personnel. So uh, this group is like it, it has strong ties with Al Qaeda, Daesh, and TTP, the band, and other outfit that has st strong ties with the Afghan Taliban. So it seems like the fault line that U.S. left in Kabul in a chaotic or dramatic withdrawal that are active now. So the question is U.S. claimed many times it built the Pakistani forces capacity to counter these groups. So at this moment, do you have anything for Pakistan, any comments for Pakistan in this specific event? We strongly condemn any terrorist attack like that. And of course, you know, our, our thoughts are with those who lost their lives during that attack. But I don't have anything beyond that. I'm not aware of any U.S. involvement or assistance to Pakistan um, at this time. But if that changes, I can certainly let you know. Yeah. Finally, just uh, one okay. more. Chinese uh, uh, Armed Forces Commander visited Pakistan and he uh, awarded with a higher military uh, award. So both sides discuss military engagement, specifically the defense productions. As I asked before from the last briefing that both countries have shared technologies and they're also thinking to expand it. Like I asked regarding the uh, GF-1700 uh, technologies here to Iraq. So the question is, uh, this administration left many loopholes with its Arab allies we have seen with the Saudi Arabia. You left space over there, China gained there, they got normalization with the Iran and Saudi Arabia. Now Pakistan is going closer with China. Anything on this, any reservation or any public reservation or private reservations you got, you have? I'm not aware of that meeting, so I can't comment on it. Yeah. Thank you. So, Rina, uh, with regard to this um, Iranian attack in the region that we've been expecting for more than a month now, and that hasn't happened. First of all, would you deem that as a success of the United States, both in terms of diplomacy and military posture in the region, that might have deterred it so far? And um, are you still expecting it as, is, is the threat as real as it was a couple of weeks ago? Are, are you still alert? So a few things, uh, you know, as we've said, I don't have the prediction calendar crystal ball to predict and, and to, to, you know, forecast an attack. 
What I can tell you is I think we certainly got into the headspace of Iran and how they're making their calculations. Um, you have two carrier strike groups in the region. Um, we have said both very publicly and privately that we are there uh, to protect our forces and will, of course, always you know, stand in the defense of Israel should we need to. Um, whether that's impacted Iran's calculation, I think it has affected their decision making. Um, will there be an attack? I just I can't. I can't predict the future. I can't answer that. Um, we remain postured, though, to protect our forces. And of course, if we need to, come to the defense of Israel. I can one more. Mm -hmm. um, earlier this week, Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff said that since we've seen the Hezbollah attack, now we can say that there's less of a chance of a regional war. Um, do you share that assessment that Iran could also conduct an attack on a similar level, not something that's going to spark a regional war? Do you think that hands are tied off a bit? because of the US military posture, do you feel like that attack is gonna be limited? Again, I, I can't predict what an attack would look like. Um, what I can tell you is I don't think anyone wants to see a regional war. We certainly don't, and that's why we've made the decisions, that the, or, or the secretary has made the decisions uh, to move different carrier strike groups throughout the region since October 7th, to rotate different, um, and to bolster force our force posture and our force presence in the region. You know, we, we announced a, uh, like a month ago, we have another squadron of F-22s in the region. Um, uh, so, you know, we're going to continue to take the steps that we need to to send a message of deterrence because that's ultimately what we're sending. And all the capabilities that we're sending, they are there to be defensive in nature. Um, beyond that, I can't I can't predict what other actors will do other than to say that we, the United States, do not want to see a broader regional war. And we've said that from the very beginning. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my question is about China. Okay. okay. Um, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan met uh, one E. Foreign Minister Wang Yi in Beijing yesterday, and uh, they um, agreed to have a telephone call of uh, theater commanders in um, in the near future. Yep. So, can you give us a, a kind of a little bit more about schedule of this phone call, and and is Secretary himself planning to have a phone call with his counterparts in the near future? So I don't have any calls to announce or preview today, but we certainly welcome any time that there are high-level mill-to-mill calls between the PRC and the United States. Um, you saw um, the National Security Advisor say just that in some of his readouts from his meetings. Um, but when we have more calls to announce, we will, but I just don't have more at this time. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, John Zebedi from Air Radio Pakistan. Uh, there were series of uh, terrorist attacks in Pakistan, and. Uh, and you just spoke about it. How the U.S. can help Pakistan in looting out terrorism from that region? Look, we always remain a, uh, willing to work with any nation that wants to root out a terrorist organiza organization. Um, we have good you know, cooperation um, with the Pakistani government. But um, in terms of these attacks, I just I don't have anything for you other than that, you know, we, we of course condemn them. Um, and, you know, should anything change in our cooperation with the Pakistani government, I'm, I'm happy to keep you updated on that, but I just don't have more to provide at this time. The defense Minister was here and uh, had meetings in this building, and a few months ago he made a public statement that today's India goes to the safe habits of individuals who challenge India's territorial uh, integrity and kill them. And after that statement, we have seen a killing of Sikh activists in, uh, in Canada, and there is an assassination attempt on a U.S. citizen, another Sikh activist in New York, Rupa Singh Pandu. So is there any discussion on that matter? Because India said they are still investigating that matter. There is one person arrested by the U.S. authorities, Nikhil Gupta. So any discussion on that? I don't have anything for you on, on that specifically. Um, there was a readout that we put out after the meeting. I'm just not going to get beyond that. Yes. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, uh, regarding to the West Bank uh, operation mm -hmm. for the IDF, um, the United Nations uh, Secretary uh, uh, Guterres described this uh, military operation um, as like a dangerous development, and he asked to stop this. Uh, and he said already that's already explosive the situation. So do you share with him uh, his concerns, and uh, especially when we see all the readout from the Secretary Austin when he called his Israeli counterpart, he'd always ask to de-escalate and don't take any steps that maybe make the escalation higher. So what do you say about that thing? Well, that, that's, you know, something that I'll reiterate here is that we certainly don't want to see an escalation. We want to see tensions to de-escalate in the region. Um, we are aware that the IDF is conducting operations 
um, in the West Bank. But again, we don't have an understanding of what that exactly is. We're trying to uh, learn more about their operation. Um, the United States supports Israel's right to defend itself against threats to its security. But as always, and as we will continue to say, um, it has to do so in a way that limits civilian casualties um, and limits damage to civilian infrastructure. And that's something that will always be imparted. Um, and you've seen that um, message come through in the Secretary's readouts with his counterpart. Yeah, yes. Thank you. I have a couple on Ukraine. Uh, today, Ukrainian foreign minister said that the Patriot system is announced for Ukraine previously uh, by the partners have not yet been delivered. Could you speak more to that? What causes a delay here? Uh, is a specific system by partners? Uh, those Patriot okay. systems that were announced for Ukraine previously. There are Patriot systems operating within Ukraine. I would yeah, defer to them. Most recently, the we have, I don't have anything to, um, uh, read out or announce on the Patriot system the we've committed to providing them to to Ukraine um, look we continue to work with them when it comes to providing security assistance the Patriot is a quite a big system that we are sourcing um, different materials and and um, component pieces from other countries to to help Ukraine um, you know I'd let Ukraine speak to 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 that more specifically but what I can tell you is um, they are getting a regular, supply and support of security assistance from the United States and other, you know, partners that are part of the UDCG. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at that. You had other questions? Expedite those deliveries given the recent massive attacks from Russia? From uh, I think we've certainly expedited delivery of uh, not just the Patriot, but, you know, other systems and capabilities to Ukraine, including reordering some orders by, you know, that were designated for other countries, we've prioritized Ukraine. So I'd actually push back on the fact that we haven't prioritized Ukraine as a country that needs it most. Noah. Mm -hmm. I want to follow up on the CMC question. Um, was there any DOD involvement in that meeting, uh, whether through preparation or actually during the call or the, the meeting itself? On the CMC meeting? Yeah, the vice chair. Which oh. um, I mean, that was an NSC-led meeting. Um, that was, you know, uh, the National Security Advisor traveled to meet his counterparts. Um, we, of course, engage at our level, but I'm not aware of any DOD participation. Mm -hmm. And I know in the con in the past there's been confusion about who the vice chair's counterpart is in the U.S., whether that's Secretary Austin or whether his counterpart is actually the Minister of National Defense there. Is this a sign that you think um, the Chinese are seeing um, the National Security Advisor as a more natural counterpart um, than the Secretary of Defense? I think it's a side, Noah, that we are having broader and more frequent communications with the PRC, which is a good thing. Uh, we want to see that happen. Um, the fact that the National Security Advisor, and again, I don't want to speak on behalf of the White House, but the fact that he was able to travel, engage with his counterpart, other officials, part of the government, um, that's a good thing that opens up uh, communications lines here, allows us to maintain those mill-to-mill -mill ties um, as well. I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah. Just a quick follow-up back on the F-16. Sure. Ukraine has acknowledged the loss of the F-16, and former rep Adam Kinzinger has acknowledged that the, the pilot lost on Monday was one known as by his call sign as Moonfish. He was one of two Ukrainian pilots that were actually very vocal here in the U.S. pushing for fighter jets, mm -hmm. um, going to training in Arizona. Uh, is there any chance that this F-16 was brought down by friendly fire, by uh, one of the Ukrainian Patriot missiles, for example? So um, again, I can't confirm the, I, I've seen the reporting, I just can't confirm it. I, I don't have that um, level of fidelity right now. Um, so in terms of if, if, if this pilot was killed and it was brought down by friendly fire, that I just can't speak to. That would really be something for the Ukrainians to speak to. Um, the United States has not been asked to participate in any type of investigation to look into this incident. So, you know, our role in this is that we continue to train and equip the Ukrainian pilots that come here um, for training. But I just, when it comes to this particular incident, and I understand the frustration, but I just, I don't have anything more to offer on it. But is there a follow-on with the F-16s that have been delivered? Is there any sort of ongoing relationship? Are, is the U.S. tracking the F-16s? Are you providing ongoing maintenance? Are they, you know? It's not just the United States. You have to remember that there's a, there's a, there's an air capability coalition that has been stood up that the U.S. is, you know, of course, a part of. Um, so it's not just the United States providing support. Um, 
absolutely, you know, the the U.S. military is working with the Ukrainians on what they need, whether it be maintenance or, you know, and, and that's, you know, telephonic um, or, you know, uh, remote maintenance support and help. Um, in terms of, you know, tracking the F-16s, I'm just, I'm not going to get into that that level of detail, but we are certainly working with the pilots and, and the Ukrainian military to make sure that um, they are able to fly and operate these F-16s in the, in, in the best way possible and making sure that they're doing safely, making sure that they're doing so safely. Um, and, you know, we're providing that support and continuing to train. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Leave it at that.